To contemplate planet Earth is to behold a miracle. This is a world unlike any other. A spinning orb of rock, liquid and gas, 24,900 miles in circumference, it takes 365 and a quarter days to make one complete circuit around the sun. As far as we know, it is the only body in our solar system to support life. Throughout human history, myths and legends have abounded about its origins. The Greeks regarded Earth as a maternal being, nurturing and supportive. So, they named it Gaia, meaning mother. The Earth is dynamic, active, throbbing with vital forces. A molten heart beats within her breast. She exhales breath of liquid flame. When she stretches her bones, her surface quivers in gigantic spasms. Enormous tectonic plates form her cladding, one grinding against the other. Over a period of time, four and a half billion years long, Mother Earth spawned conditions for the evolution of things as we know them now. From leaf to butterfly, from tundra to rainforest, from microorganism to man. Scratch her surface and her bones and sinews are laid bare. These telltale strata are the results of unimaginable cataclysm, of heat, compression, turbulence and weathering. They reveal layers of time etched in solid rock. Beneath and upon her surface are the results of untold birth pangs. Vast oceans, fabulous treasures trapped in stone, and organisms moving about in a vibrant celebration of life. Together, they make up the components of the biosphere, elements that can now be harvested by humans. Driven by curiosity and the imperative to create, people have dipped deeply into this cradle of offerings, using them all to make beads thereby uniting the entire world on a string. Ever since we humans left our footprints in the sands of ancient time, we've been intrigued by the world into which we were born. Our hunger for knowledge has inspired us to explore both above and below the ground. As we dug deep into Mother Earth's mantle, we found a treasure trove of minerals. There are almost 4,000 different minerals on the planet. Minerals form the basis of the most plentiful commodity found everywhere, rocks and stones. Many fueled our creativity and served our needs. Thus it was that we began to fashion objects of great beauty from them. I think that the original exploitation of minerals probably didn't come from mining as much as it did from finding things at riverbed sites where nature had already shaped and polished stones and revealed their color and their pattern and that made them interesting pieces to pick up and to want to have and own. And the idea of drilling them probably came from the idea of, of wanting to use them in personal adornment. 
But I think once people understood abstractly that minerals came from the earth, then they, they began to realize that you could mine for them. You didn't have to rely on finding them in riverbeds or stream beds. And so uh, eventually, just as people learned to till the earth to grow crops, they learned to mine the earth to reap a harvest of minerals. And that then encouraged the bead making that would have derived from that based on the technology of the time. From the very earliest times, the, the characteristics of the stone were important and had a symbolic meaning for the cultures. The abundance of, of stones in the early period, such as red, uh, white, black, certainly those are colors that, that could be very important and significant for, for the major events uh, in human life. You find for instance, green stones being very important in the agricultural cultures. And it's not a stretch to think that this green could represent fertility, could represent the abundance of the land. In the third millennium BC, where lapis lazuli became so important, lapis lazuli really was the way that the gods spoke to man. So it wasn't just a representation of the gods, but it really was, it was almost the word of the gods incarnate in, in the stone. Often red marble, a red softer stone, and even sometimes red, reddish carnelian was found at Neolithic sites. It's not too much of a stretch to think that it could refer to life itself, to blood. Red was a very important color, particularly combined with blue and white and green from the earliest cultures. Throughout history, the world's religions have embraced the sinews and bones of Mother Earth turning them into artifacts that have adorned our theological pathways. Stones in one form or another have been embraced because it was believed that they held mystical properties. Properties to heal, enlighten, protect, or as a means for communicating with the divine. Many religions have used stones as accoutrements during ritual. Their power was so great that some of those practices defy modern understanding. About three and a half thousand years ago, during the early period of Judaism, Twelve gemstones were embedded in the decorative breastplate of the high priest. After King Solomon built his temple in Jerusalem, the high priest would wear the breastplate on all important occasions. The most solemn of these was Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. All alone, only once every year, he would enter the innermost sanctum of the temple. This was regarded as the Holy of Holies. It is said that whenever the high priest requested answers from the Almighty to important questions, the stones would light up one by one, mystically revealing letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Read in sequence, the letters formed sentences, providing a response to his questions and prayers. The modern world is as enamored and intrigued by stones as all preceding generations. Depending on their ecclesiastical and ceremonial use, as well as on their color, their rarity and availability, stones are categorized as precious or semi-precious. The idea that there's a separation between the precious and the semi-precious is a very modern conception. In antiquity, the things that we would nowadays consider to be semi-precious were considered quite precious. For instance, carnelian, which is a, a very available and not expensive commodity in, in the bead market and the, in the decorative arts uh, in antiquity would have been considered one of the top uh, materials to covet and own, along with things like banded agate. And these things would have been set in the finest metals of the time, gold and silver, and their association with metals that were always considered precious indicates their equal value with those materials. In antiquity, people then liked color and they liked pattern and they they liked the exotic so from very early times stones would travel from the places where they were mined 
to the places of their eventual use. That lapis went from Afghanistan all the way to Egypt as early as 3000 BC, and probably earlier than that. In modern times, we really more admire uh, the crystalline structure of the precious stones, the diamonds, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, and it is how beautifully they are cut to exploit the glinty quality of their refraction that makes them precious, and also their rarity. Rarest and most valued of all precious stones are diamonds. Perhaps nowhere is their glittering place in Western society more loudly proclaimed than on the red carpet at the Academy Awards in Hollywood. The sparkle of diamonds is a luxury that cannot be enjoyed by everyone. But there are other stones that are often more affordable. Perennially popular are what are known as birthstones. They are precious and semi-precious stones that are associated with various personality traits. These include strength, insight, courage and wisdom. Often worn as amulets or charms, they are hewn from nature's dazzling treasure chest. This is the annual gem and jewelry show in Tucson, Arizona. Collectors descend on the event en masse from around the world to admire and trade a kaleidoscope of objects. From giant geodes to tiny pebbles, these are the raw materials that amateur and professional alike will turn into works of art, especially beads. People through the years that have seen beads and, and know beads very well have told me, you can't make natural stone beads out of kyanite. And I just love a challenge. <laughs> I, I tell them that with enough time, enough patience, uh, and enough enthusiasm, you can make a bead out of almost anything. Far across the globe, another bead marketplace flourishes. This one is in Beijing, China. The result of a combination of minerals, chemistry and time are on breathtaking display. Stone cutting in this part of the world is a major industry. It rests upon the shoulders of a relatively cheap labor force whose skills turn out an enormous range of pieces. Their meticulous work speaks of techniques honed over centuries. The oldest surviving center of stone cutting and bead production lies to the west of China. This is Jaipur, capital of the province of Rajasthan in India. It is more often referred to as the pink city because of the delicate shades of stone used in its buildings. India is responsible for 70% of the world's gem and jewelry exports. Much of that bounty comes from Jaipur. This is where huge quantities of stones are brought in from the farthest corners of the globe for cutting, polishing and refining. The end results are then re-exported to major markets abroad. To become a master stone cutter, an apprentice must train diligently for over a decade. At one time, stone cutting was the exclusive preserve of only select families. They jealously guarded their profession, passing their craft down from generation to generation. As demand for Jaipur's lustrous products burgeoned, 
the trade slowly opened up to others. Today, anyone with enough skill and dedication can become a master cutter. Children are often indented as laborers. Their work makes a significant contribution to production. Women and their deft fingers are also crucial to the industry. Many toil in backyards, bedrooms and barns, stringing beads onto threads. Modern technology also serves the bead-making craft. As a nation with nuclear and space programs, India boasts a very high level of industrial sophistication. Major companies use the latest equipment for designing jewellery and for large-scale production. Mass-produced items are turned out alongside one-of-a-kind pieces of exquisite beauty. Once the domain of powerful rulers and maharajas, today Jaipur boasts a buoyant gemstone industry. This has fostered a huge market, serving all who enjoy the spectacular gems born of Mother Earth. Africa, a continent rich in natural splendor. Infinite contrasts define the diverse face of this vast land. It was here, on the windswept savannah plains, that man first stood up and walked, picked up a stone, fashioned a primitive tool, and set our species on the long pathway to civilization. Beneath Africa's undulating terrain of mountain, desert, and forest, lies an immense treasure trove brimful of high-grade minerals, metals, and stones. On the continent's west coast lies Ghana. Its legendary bounties once gave it the name the Gold Coast. In the village of Akema Bompe, people work with a stone known as bauxite. It is an ore rich in iron. International conglomerates mine it for its valuable aluminum content, which is widely used in the industrialized world. But to the people of this village, the stone is treasured to create something small yet highly prized in African culture, beads. To turn out his creations, master craftsman Patrick Ashanti relies on the same techniques his ancestors practiced for at least 400 years. First, he uses a machete to shape each tiny sphere. Then he employs a simple tool, a bow and spindle. Taking great care not to crack the rounded stone, he drills a hole through it, a feature that will eventually allow it to become a bead. To obtain the raw material for this age-old craft, local villagers have to walk many miles through arduous terrain to the surrounding mountains. That's where the bauxite deposits lie. Bead making is a communal activity. The beads are mounted on skewer-like sticks. Then, young and old participate in rolling them to smooth the surfaces. The work generates much needed income for the locals. Iron in the stone creates their distinctive red hue. But when it comes into contact with other minerals in the bowels of Mother Earth, it changes color. Having black, white, and then even pink. So we have different colors. By the time you wash it, the color will show. The white one. And then we get black as the black one. 
To enhance the appearance of his creations, Patrick etches fine patterns onto their surface. The designs have special meaning, usually proclaiming the wearer's place in society. One person can do about 10 a day. You can use this for anybody who wants to dress as a chief or a queen. <laughs> Once the beads have dried, they are strung on raffia, harvested from local palm trees. Bauxite beads play a fundamental role in every facet of life here. When a newborn child is named, mother and baby are adorned with white or grey beads to signify purity, birth and vitality. Red beads are worn around a woman's waist during menstruation. Wearing beads close to the skin allows them to absorb the natural oils of the body, enriching the beads' colour and imbuing them with an iridescent glow. Bauxite beads lie at the heart of a tradition that will endure for as long as the earth gives forth its bounty, and for as long as the ancestral spirits safeguard the deposits, thus sustaining the ageless ways of the Ashanti people. On a continent far across the same ocean that laps against Ghana's shores, another stone plays a major role in human affairs. But that stone has only recently emerged from a long period of mystery and obscurity. Ever since our earliest ancestors walked the earth, we have feared death. In cultures throughout the world, people have sought immortality. Like the ancient Egyptians who built massive monuments to preserve the body and to provide safe passage of the soul to the afterlife, others also sought a pathway to eternity. For centuries, remnants of a once great civilization lay hidden beneath the rainforests of Central America. Those who built it are long gone. But the forest is not silent. It is home to a network of organisms that form an intricate web of life. Towering trees and lush wetlands shelter hundreds of species found nowhere else on Earth. Even the smallest creatures play a role in the delicate ecosystem that sustains life here. Within the lush foliage slumbers the remains of mighty temples and cities. They were built by the people known as the Maya. Originating in the Yucatan in 2600 BC, their empire eventually dominated much of Central America. The people of this remarkable civilization developed their own calendar, predicted the seasons, studied the heavens, and used a system of mathematics to precisely align their temples with the sun, moon, and stars. This is Tikal. Sprawling over 60 square miles, it was once a vast city-state founded around 800 BC. Its size and enduring grandeur enshrine it as a true classic of the ancient world. Today, archaeologists sift through Tikal's temple ruins. They hope to uncover clues that may shed new light on our understanding of Mayan culture. From artifacts unearthed here, it was obvious that the Maya relished one stone above all others. That stone was jade. Archaeologists have ascertained that the Maya believed jade gave them the ability to transcend death. It embodied the power to help them attain immortality. Jade was highly prized. It was the ultimate symbol of prestige in society. It was fashionable to flaunt it. Mayan nobility underwent painful dental procedures to have jade decoratively embedded in their teeth. But beyond vanity and fashion, jade was the means to gain eternal life. 
You'll find in a noble's burial from classic Maya civilization uh, all kinds of jade objects, jade tools, jade masks, uh, jade belt buckles, but you will also find jade figurines that will accompany the king on his journey to immortality. And to reach immortality, he must first go through Shibalba, and Shibalba is the Maya underworld. And for the Maya, that was the bottom of the ocean. So in royal Maya graves, you'll usually find stingray spines, shellfish, conch shells, spondylus shells, that all have to do with the journey that the noble will take on his path to immortality. The jade beads were frequently found in the mouth of the dead person, so they were used as in a poor man's grave to be his passport to immortality by being buried in his mouth, where his soul would pass, where his breath would pass, where he would, his soul would pass through his throat and through his mouth to the next life. His spirit would go that direction. So the jade was there in the mouth so that the spirit would pass over it to become immortal. Jade beads were also regarded as powerful amulets of protection. They were part of daily life for all who could afford them and worn as everyday adornment. The Mayan civilization flourished for at least 2,000 years, eventually dominating much of Central America and the Yucatan Peninsula. But in time, the Mayans and everything they stood for would be ruthlessly swept asunder by invading conquerors from afar. In the 16th century, Spanish conquistadors in search of new territory and treasure conquered the inhabitants of Mesoamerica, bringing their own religion and social values with them. The invaders imposed their ways upon the indigenous people. The time of the conquest, Moctezuma, the last Aztec emperor, sent his emissary to the port of Veracruz to greet Cortez as he took in two jade beads. And the words he spoke when he presented the two jade beads to Cortez were, give these only to your emperor because each bead is worth two loads of gold. And Cortez, of course, was a European. They didn't have a word for jade. They'd never seen jade. They were not familiar with jade and he couldn't believe that these natives were valuing anything as highly as gold. And so within 20 years of the Spanish conquest, the entire jade industry was wiped out because anyone caught mining jade, carving jade, trading jade, wearing jade, it was considered idolatry, the worship of false idols. And at the time of the conquest, the Spanish Inquisition was reigning supreme in Spain and idolatry was punishable by torture and death. So it didn't take the locals any time to figure out that if you wear it and mine it and carve it, they will kill you. The impact of the Spanish conquerors on the Maya was devastating. In just a few short decades, all their achievements and traditions were ruthlessly subdued, then wiped out. With the fatal subjugation of the Maya, their beloved jade treasures, their minds, and even their quest for immortality fell into oblivion. Like their history, every remnant of Mayan culture was swallowed by the jungle, there to lie dormant for centuries. This is the city of Antigua, Guatemala, it was once the official seat of Spanish rule in this part of the world. American archaeologist Mary Lou Riddinger and her husband Jay arrived here in the 1970s. Having spent years studying the Mayans, their mission was to seek out sources of the stone that they knew were regarded as a key to Mayan immortality. No one in Guatemala believed that there were jade sources and jade mines in Guatemala. And for 10 years, everybody laughed at me and said I was crazy. At first, it seemed like an impossible task. On the outside, jade boulders looked just like ordinary stone. Armed with an understanding of the dynamic forces that shape and mold the features of Mother Earth, Mary Lou and Jay patiently scarred the surrounding jungles 
for Jade. We're in Antigua. We're on the Caribbean tectonic plate. If we go 38 miles north, we'll be on the North American plate, all the way to the Arctic Circle. Where the tectonic plates come together, the jade forms through a process called subduction, abduction, faulting along the tectonic plate boundary. And the jade is pushed up like white hot toothpaste along the tectonic plate boundary. But it's mainly where the two tectonic plates come together that the jade forms. The unique geological formations began to speak silently, yet eloquently, about where the jade might be found. Archaeologists had been looking for jade, but very few had learned how to do field tests and geological tests for jade. Jade is unlike any other stone. It is exceptionally hard, harder than a diamond, or iron, or bronze. When striking a boulder of jade with a hammer, the extreme toughness of the stone merely causes the hammer to bounce off. You can hit any other rock with a rock hammer, and you'll destroy the rock eventually if you hit it enough times. No bounce, different noise. And look, look at the way it's powdering out. We're destroying that rock. If you hit jade with a rock hammer, you will destroy your rock hammers, because jade has a higher compressive strength than steel. Jade's exceptional resilience is a clue to why the ancient Mayans affiliated it with the concept of immortality. People in Mesoamerica who dealt with jade for thousands of years felt that the jade was immortal, and in fact, it has a shelf life of 400 million years. It can take a direct nuclear hit. Is it immortal? Is it going to make people immortal? It's the most immortal thing I know. Everything else can be melted or destroyed, but you cannot destroy jade. Another field test to identify jade is to compare all green stones in a liquid bromide solution. The procedure is very simple. This is jade. We're going to drop it in, and it sink to the bottom. And then what we have here is a venturine. The jade sinks and the aventurine floats. Anything that floats is definitely not jade. After considerable time and effort, Mary Lou and Jay Riddinger had successfully located one of the primary jade sources used by the ancient Maya. The site is spread along a riverbed that follows a major tectonic fault line throughout Guatemala. Mother Nature boasts a palette of many colors. When chemicals and other compounds seep into minerals and rocks over millions of years, the deposits absorb them and take on new characteristics. If they touch copper, it'll turn green. If they touch manganese and ferrous iron, you can have black jade. If it touches titanium, manganese, and iron, you can have purple jade. If it touches cobalt, you'll have blue jade. If it touches chromium, you'll have a brilliant green jade, and it's chromium that causes the imperial jade and the apple jade. That's all chromium color that causes the green. Mary Lou and Jay have now finally realized their dream by reintroducing jade as a viable business venture in Guatemala. Most people in Guatemala now realize the tremendous treasure that there is here and how important it was to their culture and their history and their heritage. And we've recreated the industry that was here for 3,000 years. Today, a thriving new industry based on jade has enriched the economy and the lives of many people. So we're very proud of the fact that it's grown way beyond our dreams. We want to keep this industry something that Guatemala can be proud of and that the people of Guatemala can be enriched by and that it's something that will always create beauty in their lives. This lovely land that spans the Americas now echoes to the sound of ancient ceremonies. The modern-day descendants of the Maya continue the traditions of their forefathers. Jade, the stone of immortality, has breathed new life into the community. But ageless ceremonies honoring the ancestors still prevail.
The quest for immortality continues. I think that anybody who's ever been touched by the jade business has realized that if you abuse the gift that's given to you, you suffer terrible consequences. If you treat it with respect and you behave correctly with people concerning jade and you have respect for the stone and for the product, it brings you tremendous great fortune. Because of a misunderstanding of geology and foreign terminology at the time of the Spanish conquest, two distinctly different rocks were given the same name. Jade is a generic term. The two correct mineralogical terms are jadeite and nephrite. They're, they're very different stones, but they are both considered jade. Jadeite is a gemstone, and at its really high end, it is the world's most expensive gemstone, and it can sell for more by the carat than diamonds or rubies or emeralds or sapphires. Nephrite is a carving quality stone. It's never used in really high-end jewelry. While jadeite is the stone that comes from Guatemala, small deposits of nephrite are found deep in the icy wilderness of Alaska. Nephrite is chemically very different to jadeite. It is also more fibrous. Nephrite is usually found in hues of brilliant green, trapped within enormous 30-ton boulders. The boulders come from a region called Jade Mountain, north of the Arctic Circle. From there, they are transported more than 2,000 miles to Anchorage by barge in the summertime, once the ice has melted. It's a major operation. Nephrite weighs in at 67 pounds a cubic foot. It takes eight arduous hours to saw through only three and a half inches of the stone, even with a heavy-duty diamond edge blade. From nature's cauldron, a huge, tough rock slowly succumbs to man's will. Whittled down, what was once a gigantic thing has become a small object of delicate beauty. Rare though it is, nephrite cannot be claimed by Alaska alone. Across the Bering Straits, nephrite jade was found all over Asia. But nowhere was it more treasured or revered than in China. China. Spectacular, exotic, different, and home to one of the world's oldest cultures. Here echoes the voice of a learned, disciplined, and refined people. A people whose history reaches back thousands of years. Like the seasons and the silence that waft across rice paddies and plains, timeless arts and artifacts remain. For three and a half millennia, nephrite jade has dominated the Chinese artistic landscape. Revered by the noble class, it was considered sacred and used in ancient religious rituals. Many ceremonies, including rites of passage like marriages and births, and even important imperial gatherings, focused on jade as holy items, drawing upon their power to give substance to the event. Finely worked jade beads dating back to Neolithic times have been unearthed in China. They were refined over the millennia. They were strung on necklaces and also used as ornaments on clothing by the noble classes. In the 6th century BC, the great Chinese philosopher Confucius pronounced that jade is the embodiment of all virtue. Given Jade's exquisite beauty, few would argue with that concept.
The Chinese believed that jade had virtues and that the virtues could be transferred to the wearer and that white jade symbolized purity and nobility and justice and green jade symbolized fertility and breath and life and black jade symbolized power. Like the Mayans, the Chinese also believed that jade embodied properties that could convey the soul to the afterlife. Han Dynasty Chinese and several dynasties after that believed that if you were buried with your body covered with jade, you would become immortal. The jade was your passport to eternity. And the Maya believed exactly the same thing, that the jade covering the body was the passport to eternity. They definitely believed that jade would bring immortality. So the, the idea of immortality would transfer itself to the wearer. Today, China is the most rapidly developing nation on Earth, unsurpassed by any other. Shanghai at night expresses everything this amazing country has become. Modern, thriving, and driven by a technological engine that has made it the workshop of the world. But alongside the skyscrapers and the glitzy electric billboards, the gentle legacy of jade prevails. Jade is very much a part of everyday life in contemporary China. Even now, it is believed that the stone has magical properties. They also believed in rubbing jade for luck, and cultures all over the world believe in rubbing jade for luck. They believe the more you touch it, the luckier you're going to get. The Chinese believe that owning jade and wearing it and touching it is going to bring them great fortune. And they, there's a, a tradition that a gift of jade given in friendship brings great fortune. I've never found a Chinese who doesn't believe that. So it gives good fortune to the receiver and also to the giver. So you always need to be giving your jade to someone else and have someone else give it to you. And it will make both people very fortunate. In the 17th century, China's infatuation with jade for adornment and artistic purposes was fueled by a dramatic discovery in neighboring Myanmar, the land once known as Burma. Dotted with spires, domes, and golden pagodas, Myanmar is home to the world's only market devoted exclusively to jade. It's a trading center that literally overflows with jade in every shape, size, and form. What's found in Myanmar is jadeite jade. And when the Chinese discovered jadeite jade in the 1700s, they immediately discarded 4,000 years of their culture of using nephrite. All the emperor and his court wanted was jadeite from Myanmar, from Burma. So Burmese jadeite immediately became the most valued and sought after stone in, among the Chinese. Treasure hunters come from all over the globe to bargain in bustling markets like this one in Mandalay. In small outlying villages, cottage industries thrive under the shade of traditional straw homes. Entire families are involved in jade bead production. Small blocks of jade are attached to bamboo sticks with hot wax in preparation for grinding and polishing the finished bead. Women are responsible for drilling the hole, turning the jade from a mere thing of beauty into a bead.
of all the beads that are created and sold here, none is more valued than the one fashioned from what has become known as imperial jade. Bright green in color, this is the most highly sought after gemstone on earth, eclipsing even a diamond. The colors that came from Myanmar first were white, uh, sort of a blue-green, bright apple green, imperial green, and that was what the Chinese emperors wanted, which is why it's called imperial jade. And chromium is what makes emeralds green. It's what makes imperial jade green. This is chromium-drenched Burmese jadeite from Myanmar. This necklace of 27 beads sold at Christie's in 97 for $9.3 million. What makes them so valuable is wealthy Hong Kong Chinese. They believe that whoever has the most imperial jade on their bodies is going to become immortal. This is imperial jade. We know from cutting its sister boulders that it's going to produce quite a bit of imperial. And this is what we call our pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This is our retirement boulder. My husband and I have decided that this is going to pay for our retirement and our son's college education. Across the oceans, another stone beckons. This one comes down to us from prehistoric times when it was first worked under the hands of the earliest inhabitants of North America. The Great American West. Not far from where four states meet, a mighty river has carved a gaping wound in the body of Mother Earth. Here, her bones and stratified organs are laid bare in a spectacular display unlike anywhere else on Earth. For thousands of years, the ancient people of North America inhabited this unique environment, living close to nature. Their dwellings can still be seen, sheltered beneath soaring cliffs, such as here, at Canyon de Shelley. The early North Americans held the earth in much reverence. The world around them was seen as a living entity. Respect for nature underpinned their religious and cultural beliefs. To them, everything was imbued with a spirit. Birds and animals were believed to harbor ancestral souls. Even rocks and plants were sacred. In this part of the world, minerals, chemistry, and time have conjured up something extraordinary. Found in many sites throughout the West, Mother Nature produced a spectacular stone, turquoise. Treasured by the Egyptians more than 5,000 years ago when it was mined from deposits in the Sinai, this is one of the most regal of nature's creations. The first inhabitants of this vast land also extracted it. Found fairly close to the surface, making it relatively easy to mine, turquoise was regarded as a stone to be sanctified. It was used in ornate items for ritual and adornment. Ancient mining sites can still be found. Nestled in the hills, 20 miles south of Santa Fe in New Mexico, lies the ancient workings of the oldest known turquoise mine on the continent. Todd Brown is a historian and works a small claim near the site of one of the original mine workings in New Mexico. The Indians have been working this mine since the 900s, they, they figure. But they was really working in the 13 and 1400s. And when the Spanish came in the last late 1500s, they chased the Indians away from here because one mile south here is the Galena Mines, which the Indians were using as a glaze on their pottery. The Spanish, when they saw it, knew it as lead for their 
guns to make bullets. So they chased them out of here and enslaved the Indians at the Galena mine to make the, to take out the Galena ore to make the bullets so they could conquer the Indians and shoot them. Because of its distinctive colors, the Indians associated turquoise with the sky and the earth. The blue stone turquoise is father sky and green turquoise is mother earth. And right here is a sample how the Indians found it on the ground. Right in here, this is how they found it. This is one of their mining tools. It's a basalt igneous rock. And you can see the grooves around it where they strapped it onto a stick and then they could hit it. And what they would hit is if they had a vein of turquoise in here, they would hit it on the rhyolite. It fractures it immediately and they could pull out the vein of turquoise to make earrings, pendants, and beads. After the West was settled by the white man, Cerillos was the bustling hub of the New Mexican turquoise industry. Once teeming with prospectors and traders, it is now but a ghost town. Nowadays, turquoise is still being extracted in small quantities from privately owned claims. But strict regulations prohibit any blasting. Most of the digging is done by hand. My mine is still another mile to the west, and I mine it once a week. This is from my mine. It's green turquoise, and that's from the aluminum and the iron in the rocks mixed with the copper. Makes it green. Gemologists attribute the radiant blue color of turquoise to the presence of copper in the surrounding rock. Iron contributes green hues to it, and the presence of water creates deeper and richer shades. Exposure to air renders the stone lighter and more chalk-like. Mother Earth's eclectic matrix of minerals have yielded stones in a wonderful array of shapes and colors. No two are alike. Jewelry designer Phil Loretto loves turquoise. He lives a secluded life in the hills outside Albuquerque. He grows his own food and soaks up the beauty of his surroundings to inspire him in his work. For him, extracting veins of turquoise from the rock is a daunting task, yet a labor of love. I start from raw materials here, you can see. I'm talking about the, trying to pull that little vein out to be able to use just what I can out of the rock itself. In some places, the veins are very, very thin. And I'm gonna have a hard time getting that out. Then I have to soak this uh, rock in water for quite a while and then see if I can um, use chisel to get it out. This stone here is a rarity. It's called um, electric blue gem. This turquoise came from, from this rock right there. And these are all Bisbee turquoise. A Bisbee turquoise or your top of your line turquoise, uh, the turquoise sell for around a, about $100 a carat. And so that's not too much <laughs> turquoise you get for a carat, you know. It takes about uh, 36 hours sometimes to even cut one little stone, which is thinner than an eyelash. And then if I break that, then I have to do another 36 hours of cutting. <laughs> Phil Loretta's hours of patience pay off. These bold pieces are some of the most highly valued items on the Native American jewelry market. The Pueblo Indians traditionally used turquoise in their adornments, deftly crafted with items such as coral and shells that were traded from coastal dwelling tribes. But that tradition was destined to change. When the Spanish crossed into these regions from Mexico in the 16th century, they brought two things with them that would have a lasting impact on the locals, the art of silversmithing and silver coins. Native Americans immediately embraced the silversmithing tradition, as well as the coins. They were melted down, then reworked into stunning jewelry 
that held and highlighted their beloved turquoise. And so a whole new tradition began. It is a legacy that drives Navajo designers Alvira and Wool Yazi. With the Navajo culture, everything natural is what we use in prayer on a daily basis. Everything natural is sacred. It has life within it. It has spirit. That is more important to realize that life is right in front of you and you live it to the fullest. With the teachings that my fathers um, brought to us, he and my grandfathers, they've always taught us that when you make a piece of jewelry, you can't just leave it as just a piece to look pretty. It has to have the culture, the significance of the symbols behind it. Each piece has an essence of what we were taught because my father, my grandfather, and their teachings, everything combined here takes almost a lifetime of learning. The, this bowl is particular. The design is called the Dawn Star. Royal blue represents the dawn. It's the most sacred time of prayer for the Navajo, turquoise, the full day's blessings, evening time of rest and reflections. The six eagle feathers are for honor, prayer, family, friends, earth, and your soul. Um, in the center, the dawn star itself is the biggest, brightest star to the east. It's the most sacred time of prayer for the Navajo. White is in the center that represents east, yellow, south, orange, west, and red on into the sky colors represents the north. This piece in the gold has a sunburst stamp to highlight as well as surround it and protect it. We always try to make a little mistake in each piece to keep the creativity flowing. You leave an opening for that so it continues on. It's a circular process. In the Santa Domingo Pueblo, artist Mary Tafoya and her husband Lorenzo invent exciting new expressions of an ancient craft. I've been working with turquoise for a very long time, and I learned that from my mom and my dad. Mary reinterprets traditional designs by using shells combined with stones, thus creating very special pieces. But resources are limited. Because of increasing demand, raw materials are not always easily available. Turquoise is becoming scarce. When, once you find a, a good source of turquoise, well, it's, it costs a little bit extra money. I like turquoise because it is always different. So a lot of people look at turquoise and they want it so blue, so free of coloration and other things. You know, I'm the opposite. I like to you have, see matrix in my turquoise. Matrix is the rocks, the natural rock formation. I think it gives it a lot of character, a lot of substance. When I find a piece that's blue-green, it reminds me of looking at, at our own little world, Earth, from, from outer space, because that's how I see turquoise. To many tourists, New Mexico is known as the land of enchantment, but to jewelry collectors, it's the land of turquoise. Once every year, Native American artists gather in Santa Fe to showcase their wares. Designers prepare year-round for the show. Oh, I love it. This is the prime show of our year, you know. It's, it's, it's beautiful. The things that we create is just spectacular. And we prepare especially for this event, you know. It's very, very challenging and it's hard work, a lot of hard work, but it's, it's fun, you know. We enjoy creating what we do. Collectors flock to the event from all over the world. I buy from any piece that I really like, but I do have my favorite person, uh, Silver Smith. I have been collecting the Native American jewelry for some 40 years, so it's just been a, a lifetime passion and collection. The most ordinary of everyday objects can be elevated to a high level of art and avid collectors are more than willing to pay for them. 
And this is a $6,000 belt buckle. How do you like it? Oh, that Five is nice. Gallons. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Finally got out of heart. Another renowned artist is Jesse Manonga. His clients flock to a showing of his latest creations in Santa Fe. Some necklaces sell for up to $60,000 a piece, and there's no shortage of buyers. You need a third mortgage on the house on this. I'm putting the turtles here. Oh. Jesse said. Justice. I always wanted to do something that turned out to this, and he designed it on a napkin. And another piece he did was this belt buckle. That was one where Jesse said he had to um, bring in a massage therapist once a week because it was so hard to work on the snow and the mountains and, and to get them right. Turquoise enthusiasts clamor for pieces in this high-end market. This is just a tribute to our Jesse, I'll tell you. He is such a talented individual. Nice, huh? <laughs> this is Jesse's, my earrings. And this side, blue diamonds. That's kind of my favorite side because I love the coral, but I like them both. This is my first piece. When I get to come out west is where I really get to enjoy it the most. <laughs> it has Monument Valley. So it's day. I think everything I have on is Jesse's. It's just, isn't that great? Two bracelets and the ring. This big old hunk of turquoise. I, I have a passion for everything beautiful and and I've always loved Native American Indian art. I had Jesse make this bracelet for me. He does magnificent work. It's all lapis and everything. He's my favorite artist. He, he does magic, magic with everything. But not all designers are as successful as Jesse. At the Santa Fe market, there are excellent artists who struggle to stay in business and it's not because of a lack of talent. Turquoise has always been the most imitated material to the detriment of these people. There's a lot of competition from, say, China or Japan or the Philippines who are copying and making a lot of this type of work and really able to undersell the handmade, authentic goods that the natives of New Mexico make. They're competing with an industry where things are being mass produced. They're working primarily at home by hand, one at a time. It has a huge adverse economic impact on Native Americans in New Mexico. Despite the competition, the craft continues and will no doubt remain so for as long as the flame of creativity burns within succeeding generations. Beyond gemstones lies another domain. Buried within the folds of Mother Earth is a panoply of wonderful material in the form of metals. The Earth's veins pulse with a substance that has long been valued by humans, from industrialists to bead makers. These are precious metals. To extract them, we have had to dig deeply. In South Africa, mines plunge nearly three miles down into the dark belly of Mother Earth. The Vidvatasrand gold seam that lies beneath Johannesburg is one of the richest deposits of gold on the planet. Mining it requires huge resources and special skills. The exploitation of a metal is different from the exploitation of a mineral because minerals demand to be cut and carved and polished and drilled to become beads, whereas to exploit a metal, generally speaking, we have to go into the pyrotic technologies or the fire technologies. Minerals are derived from ores that have to be melted and refined and then made into sheets or cast or fabricated, all of the techniques that are typical of the exploitation of metals. The important metals in bead making from the very beginning are gold and copper and silver, and to a much lesser extent, alloys made from those materials. Gold is the most precious of all metals. 
From earliest times, it was mined, then forged into countless magnificent objects for ritual and religious purposes. But above all, for adornment. Gold was always a status symbol, signifying power and wealth. It was the most coveted of all metals. Gold can be smelted and hammered into a limitless array of wonderful things. Contemporary tribal cultures continue to honor it. Because it signifies prestige, royalty adorns itself with gold. Perhaps nowhere is this more breathtakingly evident than in Ghana. Here, the Ashanti people proudly display their talents as master goldsmiths. In India, the hunger for gold can barely be satisfied. From bustling cities to remote rural villages, gold threads its way through every level of society. The sheen of pure gold has always mesmerized the beholder, inspiring artists to craft fabulous objects from it. Gold's luster is eternal. In the remote regions of northern Thailand, another precious metal is wrought in great quantities for the production of jewellery. Silver. Members of this remote Karan community enthusiastically participate in the arduous task of making silver beads. The origin of Thailand's silver industry dates back to the late 13th century when hundreds of Burmese silversmiths fled ethnic persecution, crossed into Thailand and settled in this region. Northern hill tribes have become especially adept in working with silver. This fine tradition of craftsmanship is passed down from one generation to the next. Today, Thai beads can be found in jewellery from all over the globe. Throughout traditional regions of Southeast Asia, silver in the form of coins has always been treasured. Coins often serve a double purpose. They can be used as currency or flaunted to display the wearer's wealth and place in society. Beads come from many sources. The Ashanti people of Ghana have a special talent. They produce them from recycled bronze. The process is complex relying on a controlled interplay of wax, charcoal, and bronze. Once a design has been created, a mold is made. Under the influence of heat, the wax is melted, and the final result is a lovely brass bead. Some of the items that become beads are derived from a dwindling and very precious source in nature, the world's magnificent menagerie of animal life. Ever since we humans explored the plains, jungles and forests of planet Earth, 
we have admired our fellow beings, the many creatures that make up the kingdom Animalia. Studying their ways, we have often tried to emulate them. At times, we have wanted to imbue ourselves with their distinctive qualities. These could include strength, speed, cunning or endurance. For countless millennia, the most expedient way to do this was to wear parts that came from their bodies. That tradition continues even now. In southern Africa, shamans wear bones and other parts of various animals. It is believed these summon up the essence of the creature. But animal bones also call up spirits of the shaman's ancestors, allowing him or her to transcend the physical world. Animal parts are also worn as adornment or for metaphysical protection. But far more importantly, they serve as conduits to the characteristics of the animals from which they came. Ostrich eggshells have been used by the Sun people of Botswana and Namibia since time immemorial. As long as 100,000 years ago, shells were crafted into beads, making them one of the oldest forms of adornment in all of human history. Little has changed. To create a hole in the shell so that it can be strung as a bead, the Sun used the same type of bow drill that was employed by countless generations before them. Because of its enormous strength and longevity, one of the animal parts most coveted by humans was the tusk of the elephant. This marvelous mammal, now found only in Asia and Africa, once roamed across the earth. The elephant has paid dearly for its attributes. Were it not for an international embargo on hunting, it might have already become extinct in its few remaining native habitats. Elephant ivory has been used to make many things, from piano keys to billiard balls to beads. To assure its survival in the wild, stringent measures now have to remain in force to protect this most noble and intelligent of creatures. Many other animals have served humanity's craving for trinkets, bric-a-brac and jewelry. This is the village of Loni on the outskirts of New Delhi in India. Here, the legendary ship of the desert, the camel, has become a source of material for local craftsmen. The bones of animals who died a natural death or who were slaughtered for meat are used to produce beads. Ever since elephant ivory became scarce due to the international ban on its scale, camel bones have increased in popularity. In some parts of the world, they have virtually replaced ivory. The bone is soft enough to yield to the craftsman's hand. Patterns are engraved onto the surface with a simple dentist drill. It can also be dyed in various colors, making it ideal for turning into beads. The result of this work is an attractive and affordable alternative form of bead, ideally suited to fashionable jewelry. In Alaska, Man's dependence on nature for survival can be traced back at least 30,000 years. That's when the first settlers crossed into the splendid wilderness from Europe and Asia via the Bering Strait. Those ancient people first made their homes in the northern regions of the Arctic. 
Many animals once inhabited these icy peaks, plains, and plateaus, but they have long since vanished. They succumb to excessive hunting, to climate change, dwindling food sources, and loss of habitat. Whether intended for adornment or for protective amulets, beaded necklaces were created from the animals the early human inhabitants depended on for food. Bones, tusks and teeth were carved into a wide variety of beads. Today, at weekend markets in Anchorage, Alaska, many ancient animal parts are still to be found. Replicating the ways of the first settlers, contemporary artists fashion fossilized bones into an assortment of beads. My two most important pieces to me are beads uh, in excess of 2,000 years old. One is uh, fossil walrus ivory and the other is whalebone. The ivory bead has a very large hole in it uh, and is designed all the way around symmetrically with little dots and the style is called punic. And um, Punic is a, a name of a village site that artifacts are dug from. It is the name of a culture, and it is the name of an era. And uh, this bead is proof that the ancient people made beads, so the Alaska natives now that are using walrus ivory and whale baleen to make beads are carrying on as a handicraft. Lisa Lerman Bond's husband, Roger, supervises a workshop where wearable objects are made from the extinct animal parts. This is a tooth taken from a, a modern day walrus by a, by a modern hunter. This is a tooth taken from a walrus by an ancient hunter, 800 to 8,000 years ago. And the fossil has got the mineralization and the color effect going on, where the modern white is just white, so the fossil is the stuff that I go buy. It's monetarily expensive, but in the soul, it's so rewarding to work with. It's just like, it lends itself to beads and to jewelry because of the huge array of colors and shapes and forms. Beads are a commodity. It's better to have beads than gold because more people will buy one bead than will buy an ounce of gold. Soaring mountains and glaciated landscapes echo the ghostly sounds of wonderful creatures that roamed here thousands of years ago. The mammoth, cousin to the modern-day elephant, was a grassland grazer. Some reached a height of 13 feet and weighed up to 10 tons. The exact reason behind the mammoth's extinction remains a topic of lively scientific debate. But these amazing animals are no more. The last of them died out about 10,000 years ago. When the mammoths died, I guess what happened is the bones naturally moved downhill and wound up in the old riverbeds. So now in the process of gold mining, people are digging up all the old mammoth bones and coming across mammoth ivory. Like this is from a gold mine up by Geist, Alaska. And this is mammoth. And it's ivory and it's probably eight to 20,000 years old but perfectly preserved because of the cold climate. It makes beautiful beads. Great leviathans once populated these oceans in huge numbers. Bones of marine giants speak of a tragedy that almost brought them to extinction as whalers relentlessly pursued them for their baleen, their oil, their blubber, and their flesh. All that now remains are their bleached and broken bones. These are whalebone beads. This is all from whalebone that comes off the ancient honey camps off St. Lawrence Island. And again, this bone is ancient. It's anywhere from a couple hundred to several thousands of years old. Dull sheep are still numerous throughout Alaska today. Their horns provide a source of raw material for the making of beads. Here's the back, and here's the, the inside of the material. Then you get the whole array of colors. This is all avalanche shoot stuff from uh, doll sheep that have died natural deaths in the surrounding forest of uh, Alaska. Fortunately, it is no longer a free-for-all when it comes to hunting. Though more stringent conservation measures certainly need to be taken, most animals are protected by law and are only hunted under a limited license. For bead makers and collectors, 
The only way to obtain animal parts is to collect horns and antlers that have been naturally shed. A mature male moose sheds its antlers once a year during winter. A completely new antler appears in the spring. Materials is a, is a huge, huge industry. There's people who do nothing but gather antler. There's people who do, do nothing but buy antler and cut it up into beads like me. We do moose antler and caribou antler and reindeer antler and all of our antler is fallen. It's nothing that's been hunted. It's all fallen, given to nature and we just do things with it. We'll cut it all up into little pieces and probably get a thousand beads out of this. Then, then this is moose antler that's been prepped into making beads. And so this is all the little squares that will be individually hand turned for making moose antler beads. Alaska's wildlife protection laws are some of the strictest and well enforced in the United States. In the meantime, there is a tightly controlled yet rich supply of raw materials to work with for artists like Roger Bond. These beads will be around in several thousand years. I think people will be wondering who made this bead? What was their story? Beyond wildlife, there are other organic materials waiting for the hand of the master craftsman. As the human experience unfolded, we cast our eyes about the earth and were filled with wonder. Mother Nature's larder was rich indeed. The exploitation of natural materials must be a very, very old dynamic in the history of mankind. Ever since the days that people were essentially hunter-gatherers and their daily subsistence depended upon their finding and gathering seeds and flowers and vegetal products for consumption, we also have the use of the same materials for decorative purposes. In northern Thailand, the Karen people use their own version of the age-old bow to create tiny beads from the shells of local coconuts. Children have become especially skilled at it. As in most tribal societies, nothing goes to waste. In this village, the shells become many things, both utilitarian and decorative. It is surprising what gifts from nature can be transformed into beads. This is the main flower market in Bangkok. Here, buds and blossoms are strung into Buddhist prayer garlands, or what are more commonly known as malas. Worshippers offer the garlands to Lord Buddha or to the presiding spirits in temples and shrines. In this corner of one of the world's busiest cities, the senses are overwhelmed by strands of fragrant white jasmine threaded together with marigold and orchids. During Buddhist and Hindu festivals in faraway Nepal, marigold malas proliferate. In this mountain kingdom at the roof of the world, even domestic animals and pet dogs are adorned and blessed while draped in flower malas. Nuts, seeds, and the pips of fruit are not overlooked. They too can become beads. A seed that was a beautiful color and a beautiful shape and texture, but didn't provide you with foodstuffs, could be turned into something that you could pierce and wear and use to ornament your body. So that has happened from very, very early times everywhere in the world and continues right down to today. Our earliest creations began with a substance that was one of Mother Nature's simplest commodities, clay. Pottery is found in the oldest archaeological sites, allowing us to date our pathway to civilization. Today, clay is still used in places like India for a very popular purpose, the production 
of beads. Archaeological evidence shows that clay beads were first created around 5000 BC. In this North Indian village, clay is rolled by hand to form beads of various shapes. Pierced by a stick, they are then readied for painting and design. Firing the bead makes it hard and durable, capturing forever the rich hues and variations of this most ancient of materials, loved by bead collectors the world over. The Baltic coastline. In this windswept place, waves once washed something extraordinary ashore. Countless thousand of the most highly treasured of all organic gems, amber. Untold artifacts and objects of amazing beauty have been fashioned from this most prized substance. Carved into icons, panels, and even entire rooms within palaces, amber has left a deep impression on history. But perhaps its most revered and widespread manifestation lies in none other than the beloved bead. Amber was a very important material in ancient times, and the folks along the Baltic Sea who collected it considered it to be an actual solidification of sunlight and a gift from the gods. And so if you were walking down the beach at low tide and came across a piece of amber, it was like God gave you a special gift and that, that amber would be golden and translucent like a gem and it would be warm and sunny like sunshine. So if God gave you a gift, you know, that was a great day for you. And if you found a piece of amber that had a natural hole in it, it's like God has given you a gift of something to wear on your body because all you have to do is put a cord through it and wear it and it becomes the personal amulet that you wear for your entire life. We have good historical records of gladiators studding their nets with amber for amuletic purposes. We have records of slaves being traded for amber. A good piece of amber would be worth an actual human being's life, which is a pretty remarkable thing to contemplate in this day and age. Amber was not always solid. It started out as sap or resin flowing forth from a tree. As it hardened under the influence of sun, wind and weather, it became a translucent solid object of glowing gold or burnished brown. But to reach the stage, time itself has played a crucial role. It takes millions of years for amber to solidify and fossilize. When it was still in liquid state, Amber sometimes flowed over and entombed insects. These have now become petrified within it, like victims trapped within a time capsule. The Baltic forests succumb to Mother Nature's ceaseless twisting and turning, as tectonic movement and the relentless pounding of waves swept whole groves of trees into the ocean. With them went their fossilized amber to lie beneath the depths for almost an eternity before the tides deposited the amber back on shore. This amazing gift of trees, tides and time is now being mined, for much of the amber still lies buried deep within Russia's soil. The Palmnikon open cast mine to the west of the city of Kaliningrad is one of the largest of its kind in the world. It supplies about 90% of European amber. Here, amber is found within a mineral-rich silt called blau erda, or blue earth. The soil is scooped up by a giant bucket excavator. It is then piled into heaps. Powerful jets of water wash the silt away, leaving the heavy chunks of amber intact. The amber is then transferred to adjoining factories where it is cleaned and readied for making into beads. Teams of skilled Russian craftsmen shape and polish the amber 
one precious bead at a time. Nearby Kaliningrad was once the capital of East Prussia. It is now the center of a thriving amber industry. Shops and boutiques proudly display their golden treasures. Many young artisans are learning the craft of bead making and of designing exquisite jewelry for an ever hungry world market. Baltic amber is now renowned globally. Here, it's being exhibited at an international fashion show in Tucson, Arizona. From Africa to the Himalayas, amber was so valued that demand soon outstripped supply. The result is that amber has become one of the most copied of all organic gems. These are imitations made from plastic and other synthetic material. Fake though they may be, they allow almost anyone to enjoy affordable copies that look surprisingly like the real thing. Beyond the land lies Mother Nature's largest repository of riches, the great reservoir of the ocean. Although peaks, plains and plateaus define the contours of much of Mother Earth, over 70% of her surface is covered by water. Vast oceans that make our planet unique in the solar system. The sea was the cradle of all life, a liquid spawning place that gave rise to the rich kingdoms of animals and plants that thrive throughout our world today. Within these ocean depths, a myriad life forms teem in great abundance. Much of it still unnamed and undiscovered. The oceans are the stage upon which a breathtaking drama of life is played out on a grand scale. Epic, yet precarious. For here exists a delicate balance between living organisms, chemistry, tides and temperatures. All of it now endangered as humankind's long shadow spreads ever more ominously. The interaction between people and the oceans predates recorded history. Washing up on the ocean's shores are some of the most valued materials which we have long used to make beads and other adornments. Shells were some of the earliest objects crafted into pendants necklaces and amulets. Archaeological evidence from Africa and the Middle East reveals they were first used a hundred thousand years ago. Beads of shell became so popular that they found their way from coastal regions to landlocked societies via extensive trade routes. Throughout history, one shell stands out above all others. The cowrie. 
They actually form a kind of currency that was used by people in Africa a little more than a hundred years ago before coinage was reasonably available to them. So cowrie shells are a kind of money essentially, but also they have symbolic use. They represent to the people who have them very different things in different areas of the world and also depending on their orientation. If you look at a cowrie shell with a, a horizontal orientation, it very, looks very much like an eye and you'll find it used in statues by people all over island Southeast Asia. If you look at it vertically, it's representative of the female generative organs and so it has a, a fertility symbolism that's very typical in, in Africa and also other places as well. Shells come in every shape and form. They are the exoskeletons of marine creatures and, under human hand, can be fashioned into many things. The internal layer of some mollusk shells provide mother of pearl. These are fashioned into beads and, in some societies, pearly white buttons. They are especially revered in England, where they are often used as an eye-catching cultural statement. Shells are ideally suited for the carving of tiny reliefs. Thus, a cameo is born. Under the hand of a master, a cameo can showcase the highest yet most subtle level of human creativity. In the Italian town of Torre del Greco, artists are still practicing this craft that dates back to Roman times. Treasured by many throughout the centuries as a perfect medium for artistic expression is coral. Tiny anemone-like polyps secrete calcium carbonate or limestone. This forms a hard external skeleton. Living in colonies, their structures fuse together and can become so large and complex that they form reefs that stretch for miles. It is a true miracle of nature. Due to nutrients and conditions in the water, much of the coral in the Mediterranean is red in color. It's a wonderful material not only for the color palette that it provides, but because it's durable. It's relatively hard, but soft enough to be worked with relatively low technology. So. It has been exploited as a material for quite a long period of time. Centuries ago, in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius, Torre del Greco gained fame as the center of a thriving coral industry. Even today, its beads are much sought after. These uh, are the different kind of uh, rough coral material we can find in the market. This one is a white coral rough material. It's very rare, that's why people don't use very often in uh, jewelry, because it's not uh, easy to find it on the market. This one is pink rough coral material. The color can be from dark to lighter. In Hong Kong area we have uh, this kind of uh, pink momo rough material. It's very rare, very uniform, so very rare, so very expensive. People like so much in the jewelry. The most beautiful and expensive coral rough material is this one. People name this one ox blood because the color is a very red deep. So this kind of a coral is much more hard than the others. 
in fact uh, the sound is like glass it's wonderful and uh, even is very rare so this means very expensive blood corals association with the essence of life makes these pieces command the highest prices another craftsman from a long line of coral merchants in the little town of torre del greco is alfonso vitiello This is one of the big strengths in the world now. The weight is 500 grams, it's half a kilo. Uh, we have collected this uh, coral uh, necklace in uh, 12 years, bits by bits. And the cost of 100,000 United States dollars, too much. Such costly treasures demand the highest standards of processing and workmanship. We must uh, cut the coral like the coral wants. The coral cutter, uh, you know, is like a Buddhist lama, it's uh, like a religion. Uh, we have to follow what the natural asks to us. It's, uh, you know, like a mission. If uh, don't break, the coral can survive forever. It's like diamonds. The ancient Greeks believed red coral to be solidified blood from the severed head of Medusa, the mythical Gorgon whose gaze could turn people to stone. Romans were especially fond of coral. They employed it as an amulet to protect children from abduction and from harm. Widespread myths around the world are associated with this beautiful treasure from the sea. Since Roman times, coral has been exploited from the Mediterranean Sea, made into ornaments and shipped all over the world. And there is hardly any area of the world where Mediterranean coral and eventually South China Sea coral has not penetrated. The marvelous tribal jewelry that Tibetan people wear up in the highlands of the Himalayas. No self-respecting person would go anywhere without his or her complement of coral and turquoise and sometimes amber beads. And so these artisans in Italy make specific things for specific regions where those beads are then exported to. But when you have a, a ritual tribal society that, in, that indulges in color symbolism, uh, and red is a significant primary color, you have to have a material that provides you with that color in order to make ornaments. And coral, traditionally, is, is the most significant red material. The wonderful coral beads that we see Tibetan folks wearing is an important trade good that has traveled many thousands of miles to get where it is. And one of the reasons that people like it is because it's an obscure commodity. It's not something that they can dig up out of the ground or that they can uh, trade with for their neighbors. Due to global warming and over-exploitation, the coral reefs of the world are now vulnerable and in danger of collapse. Exacerbating their demise is the high demand for coral calcium for use in both Western and Oriental medicine. In spite of dwindling supplies, the demand is still high. So much so that inferior corals are being artificially dyed in every color of the rainbow to satisfy a burgeoning worldwide trade. Without adequate measures to safeguard its future, it may only be a matter of time before the last of the coral is drawn from the ocean depths. Beneath the sea lies another miracle of nature, the pearl. Once thought to be the solidified tears of angels, pearls have long been treasured as one of the most sublime of Mother Earth's gifts. The pearl most coveted by those in the know comes from a faraway and exotic place. The Polynesian Islands of the South Pacific. This is Tahiti.
It is from here that brave warriors once set forth on outrigger canoes to colonize distant lands such as Hawaii, New Zealand, and Easter Island. The people here worshiped many gods, the most supreme of which was Ta'aroa, the creator. Other gods were feared, such as Pele, god of the volcano, Hina, goddess of the moon, and Oro, to whom humans were sacrificed. Today, Tahiti is the tourism jewel of the South Pacific. There are few vacation spots to rival it. Among Polynesia's treasures is a pearl found nowhere else on Earth. It is the Queen of Pearls and the Pearl of Queens the legendary Tahitian black pearl. They are one of the rarest pearl in the world, and they come from only the lagoons of Tahiti, the Tuamotu Islands. We call them black pearl, but they are actually multicolors. Huh? So they're very special because they have a very unique individual colors. Our lagoons are one of the cleanest lagoons in the world and uh, I guess they survive very well over here. Like pieces in a jeweled necklace, the many islands and atolls of French Polynesia are scattered across a million square miles of the South Pacific. Takaroa is a tiny atoll, 15 miles long and 5 miles wide. At its centre is a warm lagoon created by the surrounding coral reef. Conditions here are ideal for a unique industry based on the mass production of black pearls for the world market. Alexander Collins is one of the most successful of a new breed of pearl farmers. It was the pearls that brought me here originally uh, brought us here in the middle of nowhere between the United States and Australia. But uh, over time, I became more uh, fascinated, I guess, with uh, the actual oyster than with the pearl. You have to understand the way it functions, the oyster function, the way it lives, the way it reproduces and everything, in order for you to be able to create, you know, halfway decent pearls. The healthier the oyster, usually the better the, the quality of the pearl. Daybreak. <laughs> Oysters that have been selected for pearl cultivation are pulled up from their marine beds. Filter feeding on the rich nutrients in the water for three years, they have been tethered to stakes in readiness for this day. In the workshop at the edge of the lagoon, the procedure begins. It starts with the selection of the healthiest oysters with the best internal shell color. This is the quality that will determine the hue of the final cultured pearl. As is often the case with so many creatures when humans find a way of exploiting them, a number of the healthiest and most vibrant colored oysters are sacrificed. Slices of their flesh are removed for eventual transplantation into the host oysters. The aim is to reproduce the rich colors of the inside of the sacrificed oysters' shells. Maggie Collins prepares the slices of tissue for the transplant. And now, a key component. Maggie inserts a round piece cut from the shell of a mussel found only in the Mississippi River. Experience has shown that this material is the best nucleus for the creation of a new pearl. 
the tissue graft is wrapped around the inserted sphere of Mississippi shell. This will cause the host oyster to start secreting a lustrous substance called NACA that will surround the artificial intruder and harden. The result will be a pearl. Holes are drilled through the oyster shells so that they can be tethered together and re-immersed in the lagoon. The rest of the process is left mainly to nature. Over time, the little round bead that has been placed inside each oyster will slowly become covered by secretions and eventually turn into a black pearl. Every oyster bed needs to be carefully monitored. Alexander Collins has developed a sophisticated computer program for keeping track of his oysters. He will know exactly where to dive each day to examine them and ensure that all is well. This is what we do every day. This is uh, oysters that we took back on the cable. Each color represents a different activity. Like what we grafted, what we harvested, how many we took out, how many we took back, how many pearls we got. So it just kind of keeps track of the cables. We keep track of them this way. Two or three years after the grafting process, the oysters are ready for harvesting. Divers untie them from their underwater stakes and bring them ashore. After cleaning parasites off the shells, they are pried open. Seen for the very first time, a glittering black pearl. The oysters are resilient. Their lifespan is long. Most of them will act as hosts as many as three times. A good harvest, we should average between five to 700 pearls a day, so about 3,500 pearls a, a week. Every month and a half, we'll harvest for about two weeks, two, three weeks, depending on the, on the harvest. No two pearls are alike. A day's harvesting will bring about a wide variety of sizes, shapes, and colors. For people like Alexander Collins, this is all hard work. Enormous effort goes into the production of these precious gems. And it's not easy living out in the middle of nowhere. The difficulties of living here are obviously related to uh, our remoteness. Uh, we get everything by ship, uh, which is once every two weeks. Uh, we buy our gas, uh, gasoline, our diesel, and all that by, uh, by ship or by plane, but it's not that regular. Living here, I wouldn't trade it for anything. We like what we do, it's not easy, it's very, very difficult, but uh, you know, we like our lifestyle here. Those oysters that have not produced good pearls are sold to local hotels and restaurants. Nothing is wasted. The shells are cleaned and then made available to local artists who will transform them into mother of pearl jewelry. Exquisite pearl and shell necklaces worn all over the islands proclaim the beauty and rarity of these unique pieces.
pearls are sent to the big islands of Tahiti, Bora Bora and Maria for sale and distribution. Many of these treasures are crafted into jewellery by local designers such as Taya Collins. One of the most exciting part is when we actually have the harvest and I have all those beautiful pearls in front of me. I know exactly what I'm going to do with some of them and some of them I keep until I get other pearls that actually will arrive to complete what I want to do. Although they are commonly known as black pearls, these incredible gifts from nature range in color from aubergine to peacock blue. A strand of high-quality, perfectly round Tahitian pearls can fetch tens of thousands of dollars. But irregularly shaped ones, known as baroque pearls, also command high prices. It's a very personal taste. I have to say that I have a lot of my clients who actually prefer the baroque shape to the round because in a way it looks much more natural. It's much easier than diamond. You can see a good pearl from another because uh, you have just have to look at the luster of a pearl, the iridescence that it flies back to you. The design that I do is an inspiration that comes from living in, the, in those islands. I'm very fortunate and very lucky to be able to, to live in the most beautiful place and work with the most beautiful uh, pearls in the world. The fair face of Mother Nature is not confined to Tahiti alone. Everywhere you look, our planet is a place of unbridled enchantment. It is a world cascading in beauty, abundant in natural wealth. This is a world worth saving, a world worth conserving. As we are confronted by challenges unequaled in history, from global warming to species extinction to environmental destruction, it is our duty as citizens of this place we call home to reach out and cherish that with which we have been blessed. The treasures of the earth have been generous, endowing us with much for which we can be grateful. Among those are natural gifts that we have transformed into the things we love. For if you look carefully, there is nothing that cannot become a bead. The materials from which beads are made is limitless. And not only does it encompass easily 5,000 years of history, but the closer to us in time it becomes, the more broad and dynamic and variable and changeable are the materials that are exploited to become beads. And there's almost no material you can think of that hasn't been made into a bead by somebody at some time. And I don't care if it's wallpaper or rubber tire treads. It's been made into beads and it's actually been used and worn by people somewhere at some time and often in recent times. There's a great deal of recycling of materials to make beads. And it can be things in your daily environment. It can be things that are exotic to you, that are interesting because they're not in your daily environment and yet they, they somehow come to be available to you. Plastic tops from toothpaste tubes and jars and, and lids and almost anything we can think of has a bead use. And all it takes is a little bit of imagination and ingenuity and the desire to transform it from whatever it was into an object of personal adornment. Yes, even candy, for something sweet and delectable, can also be turned into a bead. <laughs>